by State Department right now. Um, as soon as that report has been reviewed and approved, then I can give more details. This is probably the kind of the toughest thing to talk about uh, when it comes to uh, ITAR, engine failures, anomalies, and investigations. So I want to be a little bit conservative about it. You mean the, the material of the engine or like a, a for, like FOD? I mean, it's a little unclear what you're talking about. In, in the jacket of the engine. Todd? Uh, Todd Halverson of Florida today. Um, even though it might be difficult, I wonder if you could uh, tell us what steps you've taken to prevent a recurrence of the uh, engine out that you had. And I'm also curious about how many launch attempts with the Falcon 9 you can make in a row. In the old shuttle world, you know, they'd usually try twice and then stand down a day. I'm just wondering, can you do three, four, five in a row? I'll take the second question first. I'm not aware of any uh, issue that would cause us, from a vehicle perspective, to have to uh, come back down and, uh, and roll back into the hangar. Um, now, there would be NASA cargo that we would have to deal with if we were to uh, delay uh, substantially. Um, as far as what we did to clear the engines for this particular flight, uh, we did extensive analysis, obviously, to understand the problem, uh, extensive um, assessment and testing on these particular engines. Uh, the field of science that we're talking about is called NDE, non-destructive evaluation. Uh, it's as much an art as a science, um, and we certainly are getting much better at it uh, as, we, uh, as, as we mature here. But I'm going to make a shameless call for any uh, extraordinary NDE experts that want to come and change the state of science or the state of the art, uh, we're hiring you at SpaceX. Jason? Yes. Uh, Jason Ryan with AmericanSpace.com. When you uh, gave the uh, total for about, uh, I'm going to look back at a PDF that I got here from uh, that was issued from SpaceX. Uh, 20,000 kilograms, I believe, is the amount that you are required to launch the International Space Station per CRS contract. And given the numbers, uh, I had to do a little quick math there, and forgive me if I'm a bit off, but the total I've come up with is around 14,000. Uh, can we expect a uh, dramatic uptick in, or at least an uptick in the amount that you're lifting per these flights, or they remain fairly consistent. Uh, kilograms to pound conversion being what it is, I'm I, I hoping my numbers aren't too far off. Thank you. I think your numbers are off, but I hate to do math in public, so we can chat offline. Um, but uh, the, 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 cargo, the cargo requirement is 20 metric tons of carriage up and back. Uh, we will far exceed that with the 12 missions that we have. Uh, the upgraded Falcon 9 launch vehicle will accommodate a dramatic increase in cargo as well. Uh, so you will see an increased amount of cargo, both due to probably NASA comfort with our maturity uh, in getting to space station. In addition, uh, the upgraded Falcon 9 allows additional carriage of cargo. You mentioned the upgraded uh, Falcon 9. When can we expect to see the first launch of that from, from here, I guess? From the Cape. The first flight of that vehicle will be from Vandenberg. We'll be carrying the Cassiope satellite for Canada. Uh, and that launch should occur uh, the first half of this year, probably late first half of this year, late June. Then we have two additional commercial missions uh, to fly uh, right away. They will be here from the Cape, uh, both SES. Uh, as well as TICOM. We'll, so we'll fly two GTO flights uh, right after Cassiope, and then um, uh, potentially an ORBCOM flight or CRS-3. Uh, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. Um, what drove the flight day two rendezvous and, and grapple, uh, the accelerated schedule? Was there some particular need? And uh, excuse the levity, but last time you flew ice cream, anything uh, sweet on board for the crew? Was that direct, I'm assuming you directed that at me. Uh, it's, I think it's purely orbital geometry. Uh, we just end up launching at a time when the space station is closer. Is that accurate? Close Without going to orbital mechanics, Anya. Um, and then there is a crew package. Um, it's a little bit healthier, I think, than the one that NASA sent last time. Um, it came from one of our employees' father's orchards. Okay, over here. Hi, Robertson with NASA Social representing Pinehead TV. Uh, my question is about the solar arrays. Um, in the situation that they don't deploy, how do, um, what happens with the mission? Does it get truncated? And then also, what happens should they not function once they're deployed? How does that affect the battery redundancy on board Dragon? That's a really good question. Um, 
I don't know the answer to that, but I will follow up. Uh, we do have very uh, pretty extensive capacity batteries on Dragon. I just don't. I'm pr we might be able to make one attempt uh, at bursting with the ISS um, just on the batteries alone. I don't know that from a system perspective we would consider doing that. But let me let me follow up on that. That's a good question. Bill, uh, Bill Harwood with CBS. I'll ask an engine question to Mike. Um, that was a pretty dramatic. Uh, event during CRS-1. I mean, I've never seen in 25 years that much hardware come off a rocket and you still get to orbit. Um, that's reality and it's a compliment to you, Gwen, I guess, because the thing did get to orbit, as you say, that was remarkable. But what, Mike, what, do you, what did you have to see to make you confident that they have, in fact, done what they need to do to make sure something like that doesn't happen again or something worse? Uh, that's a good question, Bill. Um, you know, it's sort of uh, a unique uh, relationship that we have in the past, and, and I've been asked this in public more than once. In the past, because of the uh, build of the vehicles and the, the um, taxpayers' dollars used to build it, we typically have been very open about everything that we have done and looked at and found uh, within the boundaries of the law. As they uh, as they exist today, and so um, with this new relationship, we have two things. We still have the same laws we have about export control and worrying about the ITAR, uh, but also we have proprietary information that that uh, you don't want to get out into the open. But the relationship we have with SpaceX is such that uh, we we see anything that they see, and we've sat next to them and worked with them and provided some uh, some uh, assistance, uh, a little bit of expertise. Uh, they borrowed some of our NDE guys, as, as was shown, so we could stare at, uh, at interesting, uh, uh, I'll call them pictures, for, uh, uh, to keep it as, as bland as possible. But um, quite a bit of work was done to try to analyze the cause of the anomaly. We participated in all of that. Um, it, we, uh, there, extensive work was done on the history of the engines and the testing done to the engines prior to flight, uh, what they were exposed to, how they were, how they were inspected before they were assembled, uh, how they're assembled. Uh, all of this work we went through with them. Um, and so the conclusions they came to, uh, we agree with. The work they did to ensure that this vehicle is about to fly, uh, we agree with. And, uh, and our role, of course, as NASA is to sit next to them and, and, uh, and work with them and understand the anomaly so that we're comfortable. We have, we have two options as the customer. We can either put our hardware on that vehicle or not. And uh, when we were done, we, uh, we felt like the risk we were accepting with this flight was the same as we had accepted with the previous flights. And uh, we put all the hardware we, had, we needed to fly on that vehicle. So we, we didn't have any restrictions on the hardware that we put on, that, on this vehicle for this flight. I'd like to clarify, Bill. The, uh, the pieces that you saw uh, in the plume were the fairing, basically secondary structure. I just didn't want anyone to think that, uh, that the engine flew off because that was there out in the blogs as well. Yeah. Dan? Hi, Dan Billow with West TV for Gwen Shotwell. Um, <clears throat> what would be the effect of a sequester on uh, SpaceX's milestones for this year? You have a lot of stuff going on at the launch pads out there and on the, the goal stated in your press kit to launch astronauts by 2015. Uh, the sequester won't impact uh, any of SpaceX's commercial business that we have this year. Um, Mike will have to comment on sequestration and its possible impact on CRS-3 um, as well. I'd need someone from the commercial crew office to talk about any impact uh, that they would have on the milestones that we plan to execute. It's not up to me, it's up to my customer. Uh, from a sequestration standpoint, our, our initial looks from an ISS program perspective, we won't uh, get an impact that will cause us to uh, change our plans in any way as we know it today. Ken. Hi, Ken Kramer for Space Flight Magazine. Um, two questions for, for Gwen. One is a follow-up, actually. I have a similar concern to Jason about, about the weight that you're carrying up. Um, are you maxed out on the weight of this version of the uh, Falcon 9, and is it the maximum weight? The other question I'm wondering is about there were some other anomalies on, on the uh, last flight related to the glacier freezer, freezer and the... Um, some of the computers that were made up may not have been radiation hardened sufficiently, one of them knocked out. So um, what have you done to address this, please? So the issue that we saw with Glacier was there was some water intrusion uh, uh, in the, um, 
uh, in the service section of the Dragon capsule uh, after we landed. Uh, we have since put um, good measures in place. This vehicle was largely built uh, after after that vehicle after CRS two or CRS one landed. So we put we retrofitted this vehicle uh, to the extent we possibly could. We think we've eliminated the issue. The next Dragon that we fly will have even more robust methods to keep water basically out of the of the, that particular element of the service section. So basically, water got into the service section, um, and I don't know exactly whether it shorted out some of the power to Glacier or not, um, but the power was uh, out on Glacier until uh, uh, the recovery crew got Dragon back on board, so it was two between two hours, two and three hours. It was almost four. Oh, almost four hours. Thanks for the correction. Um, as far as the uh, uh, flight, the Dragon computer anomaly, um, I don't want to say that it wasn't radiation hardened enough. The system worked exactly it was designed to. Uh, we are we have designed a electronics architecture that's radiation tolerant, uh, so we accept faults. Uh, the systems recover uh, and we continue to fly. We did, so there's three flight computers on Dragon. Uh, this particular item, uh, this particular fault, uh, took the, the, that particular computer out of sync with the other two. We de they were all three operational. We decided for many reasons, many, I don't necessarily want to go into them here, we decided to not resync up that third computer with the other two, so we flew home on the two computers. The system is designed to fly on one, uh, two represents some good redundancy. Um, we would have to have resync that computer if we, had, if we took another fault, so we have to leave station with two. Okay. You know, I don't know if we're maxed out um, up or not. Um, we're probably close on this particular flight to be max math. That's understandable. Yeah. Daryl. Let's see, but before you go on, I'm sorry. The Glacier comment, let, I want to talk about that a little bit because there's enough discussion out in the airwaves that I, I ought to um, discuss it a bit. You know, glaciers are very important to us. This is our way to get our, our samples home. Um, after the demo mission, uh, when they first uh, had this water intrusion problem in the in the service section, and by the way, this is not the pressurized volume um, of the capsule. This is a lower portion of the capsule that's open to the environment. Um, the SpaceX folks came to us and asked, talked to us about the anomaly, talked to us about the likelihood that the uh, the power would fail to the glacier before the uh, capsule was retrieved. Uh, we talked about worst case, best case scenarios, and uh, and based on that information, we chose which samples to put in the glacier. Uh, we filled the glacier up coming home and the samples were fine even with the with the loss of power and, and, the, and the, the loss of power time, I don't remember the exact time, was within the window that we had analyzed. Uh, for, this, for this flight, uh, the SpaceX uh, team uh, went to great lengths to go in and make mods to these uh, particular boxes and the cables that lead into them to try to seal them up. Um, and we, as, as uh, Gwen said, we have a, a modification of those boxes, a permanent modification of those boxes coming on the next, on the next dragon. But on this dragon, in an attempt to give us a little more uh, time, they went off and, uh, and made a mod to the boxes. They actually tested in a water chamber. Uh, so we feel like our time to failure, if it occurs, is uh, shorter. And, and using that information, we went back to the researchers to decide which samples to bring home this time. Uh, and in no case did any researcher want to not come home uh, in this glacier. So again, we'll fly the glacier home with the research we need to bring home. Uh, so this has not constrained us in any way, and that was what I've been hearing a little bit about in the airway, so I just wanted to make it clear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Daryl. Daryl Dale Fox, Orlando. Um, Charlie Bolden uh, wrote Congress and told him that uh, one of the milestones that couldn't be funded was the SpaceX in-flight abort test review. What is that test, and, and would that not push out a return uh, to uh, American astronauts into space? And in the question for NASA, does the sequester, uh, does, is it weighted towards commercial crew in terms of the cuts? You want to answer first? I'll go first. So if sequestration occurs, and if NASA has to decrease the commercial crew budget, there will likely be an impact to our milestones. My comment before was not to say that there isn't. It's just that I don't know exactly what will occur. Uh, I don't know that sequestration will occur, although I have a pretty good guess. Um, and uh, if it does occur, I don't know what steps NASA is going to take. I don't know what programs they're going to look at. Uh, and I don't know how they're going to restructure their funding. So. 
there has been some discussion about specific milestones uh, out in the airwaves, as Mike would say, but I've also